This episode is sponsored by the Cornell S. E. Johnson College of Business. The Cornell Executive MBA Americas program is designed for goal achievers from any industry. The program works by advancing your career without interruption, by providing global perspectives and intimate classroom settings, and by challenging, informing, connecting, and propelling you. Achieve your goals with the Cornell Executive MBA Americas program on the weekend and close to home. Search Cornell EMBA Americas in my city today. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Maricela Herrera and Megan Oliver. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. I am Maricela Herrera, the CEO of Elevate Network, and your host here with my co-host, Megan Oliver. Hello. I'm trying some radio voice. Yeah, I can tell you're doing very like, <laughs> I don't know what the word, I don't, I don't know enough radio terminology to know what you're doing, but I can hear it. I'm trying, trying, trying something new here. Keeping yeah. you on your toes. This is Elevate Radio, KTXY. <laughs> How's it going, Megan? It is going well. This is the last one we will be recording while I am in New York that's exciting how are you feeling as this comes out i will be in texas so all of the craziness of packing will be behind me so that'll be nice um mm -hmm. it's gonna be next week that i i know in my soul I, like i've gotten stuff done but i know in my soul that i'm gonna procrastinate half of it until the week of i can see that <laughs> I would do the it's same, just, I think, is what, you know, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's like I have, like, I've gotten stuff packed. I've gotten, like, you know how, I like, the other day, one of my big tasks was, you know how you have, like, catch-all storage bins? Yep. Um, And I, I cleaned one of those out. I cleaned the main one out that had the most stuff. And so that was, that got a lot done. I've been sending my books home, so I've got that done. I've sold a lot of my furniture. It's just going to be about like packing the last few things that I'm going to in my head and be like, oh, it's only right. this, this and this. Right. It's not that much. And then uh, it's going to be way more than I think it is. Right. That's the problem. It's you, yeah. uh, since you are doing stuff, you then underestimate what's what's left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I already told my roommate to like watch out because I'm definitely going to be like walking up and down the halls of this house apartment like shouting, like, what is wrong with me? Why did I do this to myself? And that's coming. But but she literally said, because she's getting her own place in uh, New York after this, after we're, because we're not renewing the lease, obviously. And she said, oh no, I will be doing the exact same thing. Oh, she's you're like, both packing at the same time? Ooh. No, she has a little bit after oh, me okay. because I'm going home a little bit earlier, partly to find an apartment because she already has one set up. Right. Um, partly to find an apartment, partly... <laughs> Because the NCAA gymnastics championships are the week after I head home. So I was like, let me just go the week beforehand so I can go there because it's in Fort Worth. <laughs> and uh, but so she's she's a little bit behind me on the timetable because she doesn't have to leave until like May. Okay. Yeah. But it feels like if you're both doing that at the same time, it would be massive just stress. <laughs> yeah no luckily that is not that I'm running around right now like a crazy person and then she'll be a few weeks behind me but she was like oh I guarantee it's coming with me too she'll be yeah. like what is wrong with you? why I did I do this I mean I don't know I wish I was the type of person who would do things way in advance but I am not that's my I, mother I I thrive a little bit on chaos my mother does not I, I left home so early and haven't really been back I mean, I'm back, but I'm back as a guest. Um, so I think everyone just gave up. <laughs> Every time they yeah. come to my I apartment, say that I've gotten like, much yeah. Yeah, I think I've gotten much better. It's just that Connie Oliver standards that are high. Through the roof. Yeah, but nothing is, is standards like, because if you think my jump to her is crazy, her jump to her mom in terms of like um, my grandma Grace love her to pieces absolutely adore her um she is the cleanest person i've ever met in my life she i mean she actually loves cleaning she loves you know tidying everything and 
So it got to the point where there are some times where she'll be washing the dishes or she would like tidy up my room when she was visiting and I would feel bad. And I'd be like, oh, you don't have to do that. And she's like, no, 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 I like to do this. And I was like, all right. But like nowadays we have to actually step in because she's older and we have to be like, grandma, you, you can't, we will take care of this. You can't like, you don't need to be on your feet that long. Um, But uh, she'll like, she would like, flip my mom's coffee maker upside down, take it apart, find some like little nook and cranny that nobody else knew existed. And she's like, Connie, why hasn't this been washed? And my mom was like, because mother, I didn't know it was there. Oh boy. Yeah. So like, it's really funny to get my mom, to have my mom who is, you know, always getting onto me about not being organized enough told off. Like she's the slob. It's really funny to me. Well, it's, you know, we talked a lot about family last week. <laughs> yeah. It does. It's, it's complicated. This has just become a family therapy podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Same. <laughs> um, well, I have, speaking of family and therapy, <laughs> no, it really doesn't have to do anything with this, but I think I've mentioned this book that I was reading um, a couple of weeks ago. It's called Bittersweet, and it's by Susan Cain, who actually is the person who wrote Quiet, which was all about introverts, one of the yeah. first books on introverts that came out. And this is her new book. And I highly recommend it. I first heard about it on We Can Do Hard Things, um, Glennon Doyle's and um, Abby Wambach's podcast, which I also recommended on this podcast because I love it. Uh, but it's it's really interesting. It's all about life and the bitter sweetness of it and what that means. Like, why do we like listening to, or some of us, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us, listening to some sad music or the feeling of longing and melancholy that might be present. But it's not just about sadness. It's not really about sadness. It's also about appreciating the beauty in life. And I, I really liked the book. I really enjoyed it and made me feel seen in many ways because I am one of those type of people who might come off sometimes as sad or melancholy or... And I don't think you could tell on this podcast, <laughs> but the reason, which is the reason why I brought up family, because I know in my family, a lot of them are always worried that I'm sad or that something's wrong with me. And yes, fine, I have clinical depression, but <laughs> sometimes I'm really not sad. It's just that there's there's this feeling of life and both beauty and sadness and longing all at the same time and it's actually yeah. something that with this book I got to understand much more and understand how powerful it is so if you ever feel gonna, like that I think it's a good read yeah I'm gonna have to pick that up because I generally try to avoid things that make me sad just because I get so like, I don't want to say wallow in it because I don't intentionally wallow in it. But like, I it just like kind of, it's hard for me to get out of that place. Mm. Um, which I think makes it all the more, once I actually get into that place, harder to get out because my right. body is probably trying to grapple onto that, you know, feeling. Um, not to say that I don't struggle with it. I do all the time. Um, and, uh, but that's... A conversation for me and my therapist <laughs> it's a it's an interesting book and it like the type of things where I'm saying sad songs are not necessarily extremely sad so she she uses Leonard Cohen's hallelujah as a big example and a lot of his music and it's it's beautiful music but when you hear it it's filled with longing is the best word I can I can use yeah, I, I I mean I think that's Adele for a lot of people, right? Or like, yeah, or or even uh, not all of Taylor Swift, but like certain Taylor Swift albums that are just like very. Um, I I used to listen to I I, I have never experienced um, what Eliza 
Hamilton went through in Hamilton, mm-hmm. but the number of times I have listened to Burn and oh, like just a, the raw feeling song. at the end yeah. of Burn, like, ugh. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. Is is I do absolutely do that. It's a it's it's I do recommend it. It's it's an it almost felt like a little bit of permission to feel the way I feel. Yeah, which is always good. Right. Um, yeah, anyway. I've been getting into, yeah, I've been getting into um Gosh, it's a lot of rewatch stuff for me. I've been, I found out one of my roommates has never seen America's Next Top Model. So obviously we had to watch through that. And all of it's bananas beyond problematic. When you see it this this long after? What? Oh, oh my God. It's like, I've seen like 13 seasons of it. Um, It's completely off the rails. Like every single episode should come with a warning of warning the way that these people are about to be spoken to or the way they're about to speak to these models is a way that no human being should ever be spoken to in their entire lives. I haven't rewatched it in so long. I mean, I never rewatched it, but I watched it back when, you know, back, back. Um, But I can imagine it didn't age well. (laughs) Oh, it does. It ages. It ages like it ages like. I don't even know what ages badly. As badly. It ages like America's Next Top Model. <laughs> but like, it's also so addictive because I- I've heard um, on a different, po- on a podcast one time, not about America's Next Top Model, but about a different show um, where they were talking about with America's Next Top Model, they had like no budget the first season at all. Oh, really? The one thing they had was a really, really good editor who edited it all together and just like made a really strong show out of it. And like, it's so addictive. So like, at... Like at the very near the very end of the first episode, my my roommate was just staring at me, and just like, and she was just saying like, this is the most the ho- most horrible things that they are saying to these girls and these women. Like, and then at the end of the episode, she then turns to me and goes, "But we're watching more, right?" And I was like, okay. "That's the correct answer." Yeah, um, it is addictive. I remember that about it. Yeah, sure. yeah. I, I want to be clear. I in no way endorse anything. That is said on America's Next Top Model ever. <laughs> it is terrible. But God, if, if it isn't a fun time. And you get to see pretty pictures. And pretty people. you get to kind of get into the fantasy of making somebody a supermodel, even if it really didn't ever truly work with any of the seasons. But like it didn't work. I feel like a few people got got they got contracts. A lot of people got contracts. Like they definitely made it farther than they would have without the show. But like nobody, they acted like they were going to make a supermodel. Oh yeah, no, nobody no. ever became a supermodel. Yeah, my favorite's Eva, season three. She's the best. I don't remember. Clearly, oh, then the it best. didn't really work that well. Yeah, she's. I love her. I adore her. Um, I still follow her on Instagram. But yeah, so there's that. Um, and then my other, my other, my former roommate. Has never watched Gossip Girl, which is also trash, but like high trash, like the I best will, kind of trash. I will disagree. Gossip Girl is fantastic. Though I'm that's what I mean, is high trash. Like yeah. it's the craziest thing imaginable. I love it. And so uh, we've been doing because she's in California, we've been doing like watch parties for it. So good. Uh yeah. Gossip Girl was was quite the thing while I was woo, it was back in the day. But yeah. Um, ironically, a person I interviewed today, not who you're going to listen today in today's episode, but I taped an interview earlier today with someone else and we talked about Gossip Girl. So there's something I love Gossip Girl. (laughs) Yeah. Gossip Girl is in the air. Did you watch the sequel show? Absolutely not. I hated it. I saw one episode. You do not watch. I I also haven't watched the sequel um, for Sex and the City, even though I loved Sex and the City. But I don't. Yeah. I heard. I think that one was better received. Like I, I hated the like. Literally, we watched one episode, and I was like, "This is terrible." And even my roommate, who loves Gossip Girl, watches it like every year, and like she made it through the first season of the new one, and then like fell off somewhere in the second season, where she was just like, "I just do not care." Like I just don't care. Yeah. No, I I don't give sequels that much of a chance, to be honest. It's also not even with the old characters, right. which like Six of the City at least is. Like if yeah. they had brought back some of the old characters and maybe they maybe they had cameos. I don't know. I only saw an episode, but like it wasn't about them anymore. And I'm like, I don't care about these people. Right. Who are these you people? Get, you have to get reinvested in other people. 
Yeah, and I'm like, but they, but none of them were like enjoyable or even remotely likable. Like a lot of the people in Gossip Girl are bad people. Ultimately, like you would not want to actually be right. friends with them. But like they're you're so invested in their storylines, whereas like I was not invested in any. Also, they threw like they're like ten main characters in the oh, first episode. I'm like this is I can't keep track of any of these people. Well, well, luckily for the next twenty minutes, you only have to keep track of one person. Yes, and that's Spicy Maddie, who is our guest today, and she is the founder and CEO of the Spicy Life. She is a relationship and communications expert, and she's fantastic. We have a really great conversation. Uh, you might hear me sighing a little, um, <laughs> or using this as a little bit of a of a what am I doing with my life episode, which kind of happens more often than I care to admit. Um, yeah. But Spicy Maddie, she she's fantastic. She's a matchmaker and a relationship expert. She takes people through a program, but you can also work with her directly. And she helps you with identifying and finding your purpose mate. And I love that concept of a purpose mate. And she talks a little bit about that, what that is. And I don't know, you're going to have lots of fun. She is so much great energy and uh, just really fun to talk to. So hope you enjoy. Yeah, totally. I am here today with Spicy Maddie. Do you say Maddie or do you Spicy Americanize Maddie. it? Spicy Maddie. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> Americans Americanize it, uh, but I say Spicy Maddie. <laughs> okay, Spicy Maddie, who, by the way, has the best name ever. Yeah. Not not just the Spicy Maddie, but the actual real name. Maricela. Another Maricela, so <laughs> Tokaya. Uh, Spicy Maddie, so happy you're here. I cannot look... People who listen to this podcast will keep me honest. I don't get giddy that often, and I'm a little giddy. I think this is going to be so much fun. Ooh, excited! Why don't we start by uh, so our so our listeners can realize why I'm so giddy? Why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about what you do and how in the world did you end up doing this? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I am a relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker. I run the spicy life. So I'm the founder and CEO where I help uh, the superior man and superior women attract their purpose mate. And your purpose mate is the person who's supposed to help you on your mission in life. And um, the way that I do this is through a 90 day five phase program based on my spicy fundamentals, which are self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. So those five elements are what you need for a healthy relationship. And the acronym also spells spicy. Uh, I started doing this and have been doing this all of my entire freaking life. So uh, <laughs> when I was a little girl, I already knew um, the importance of relationship because I noticed that my mom was a single parent. And I didn't have a dad. So I made it my mission in life to set my mom up so that I could get a father. And three marriages later, while I did, you know, have a gift in um, helping connect her, uh, she wound up seeing like the potential of my power and made sure that she directed me in the right way as far as having healthy relationships. And so made sure that I had an education to support the spiritual gift that I had of connection. And so that's what really like fueled me making sure that I understood the academia and the studies and the research behind what it takes to have a healthy relationship. And then in my master's program is where I created my method. I love that. <laughs> I love that, that that support came, you know, early on. Absolutely. Uh, I've been doing this literally all my life. Like I've had radio shows on relationships where I gave spicy tips and then um, went to school for it. And then in running my own practice, it also gives me opportunity to do case studies um, on my clients and see what works and uh, what's more effective. I will not match you though, unless you have gone through the coaching. So 
the goal, oh, goal smart. the goal is for you to be able to match yourself though, right? I want to give you the tool so if anything were to happen to me, you could feed yourself. So essentially, I'm teaching you how to fish. I'm teaching you how to fish. I love it. I love it. Well, as our listeners will now understand, as a single woman <laughs> who's turning 40 this year, I have so many questions. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Get at me. Well, first, let's start with the concept of a purpose mate. Okay. I find that very refreshing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that we... um from a very young age, right, are sold this fairy tale of like your prince charming and your princess that needs to be like saved or rescued. Um, and I think that it's ingrained in us early on that partnership um, is this amazing thing that we should always strive for. However, mm -hmm. that narrative isn't pushed um, on men the same. What men are supported in, in areas that they're really driven in is like a, a goal achievement and um, making sure that, you know, they become like the best leaders possible. But mm -hmm. for us as women who, you know, could also be very career driven, um, I think both people, male and female, need uh, this this um, larger than life reason to be here that doesn't just serve yourself, but serves others, right? I'm, a, I'm, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. And it always goes back to the mission. What's my mission in life? And how do I serve um, God's universe? And so with that, you have to have a clear understanding of your purpose. It's not just about what you do on every day, as far as your career is concerned. It's like, what's the bigger purpose? Because wh whatever my purpose is, I'm going to take that with me, no matter what industry I'm in, no matter what relationship I'm in, no matter who I'm connected to, my purpose is going to come out. There's always going to be something that's connected to the purpose. So when you are a woman who has a clear vision of your purpose, you're not just looking for a soulmate where somebody gives you these like butterfly feelings, right? Because chemistry, we can create that. When you're a woman who wants relationship, it's more about, okay, not only is he a leader, but does he understand uh, what I have to offer the world and will he help me get there? And for the male, it's the same exact thing as well. Males go much further when they're in relationship. They make much more money when they're in relationship and they actually live longer and have healthier lives when they're in relationship. So there's all this benefit package that comes with them being in relationship with us. But I think because they're so um, goal focused and they're afraid of like the loss component, like, dang, what do I have to sacrifice? What am I going to lose if I get in relationship? It's very important that we one, that they understand their purpose, and then two, that they see companionship with someone who's also walking in their purpose. So it all circles back to your purpose mate. Is this someone who's going to help me get where I'm going to serve the greater good? But it's not necessarily saying you both have the same purpose. You guys don't necessarily have to have the exact same purpose, but the person does need to support your purpose and help you get there. Right. Right. If, if they're if they understand the mission, more of a synergy. Yeah. If, they're, if they understand the mission and it's in alignment, they will help you get there. Right. Me and my husband serve two different purposes. However, he works with me at the spicy life and he understands the bigger picture and we use his purpose to help fulfill my purpose. Yeah, It's so such a different way of of viewing relationships, I think, than what we've been conditioned to view them as. Like you were saying, it's so refreshing. Yay. I love to hear that. <laughs> I think um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Look, I, I deal with, I, I talk to women, incredibly successful, badass, amazing women all day long, every day. Like literally that's my job. And we talk about purpose so much when it comes to our careers, when it comes to, you know, kind of a lot of things mm -hmm. really. Um, it always, I, I find us always going back to values and purpose. And I am, but I do believe that you don't find your purpose magically. You kind of build it. Yeah. Um, but I would never heard someone talk about purpose in the relationship part of life, which to me is, it makes so much sense because if we're saying it's the most important thing for like basically everything else. Right. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be the most important thing for such a big aspect of our lives? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I don't know. 
I'm just agreeing with you. I <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it, it helps you refocus, right? It helps you recenter. So right. if, um, cause we, we're humans, we're going to have our bad days. Um, sometimes we're not necessarily going to feel the butterfly and raindrops that you feel mm. or you desire in relationship. But if you understand that, Hey, I'm not infallible, but I do have a mission and I do have a goal. And if the decisions that I'm going to make are going to affect my partner and steer us away from the goal, maybe I need to rethink these decisions. So if you guys understand the purpose, you're always able to circle back to that to stay on track. And sometimes it requires also a sense of um, some some self-regulation. Like, hey, I may not be feeling like this in this moment or you know, I don't, I don't necessarily feel like maybe I'm doing this active service that will fuel my husband's love language. I'm not in the mood, but I understand the purpose. And in order for us to get our goal achieved, he needs to feel these emotions or he needs to um, feel loved. L- let me make sure that I operate and I, and I perform right now. But what about those butterflies and those other feelings? When you're, when you're operating and and let me help you understand what the superior man and superior woman is. Um, When you're operating as your highest self, you're overriding your wounded child self, your, your shadows, you're Mm. overriding those things. You're operating from a higher level of consciousness. And so what that means is you're being your best self. What would my future self do? What would the self do who was healed? What would the self do who was whole and who was madly in love with themselves? Well, that self's going to perform and operate at a, a, a way higher level, which means that person's going to come through no matter, even when they don't feel like it. And so that person's right. going to always be mindful and thinking of, okay, how can I create the spice in this relationship? How can I operate with more self-awareness? How can I make sure that I do experience passion for myself today, therefore being able to maybe feel my partner's passion? Uh, How do I connect um, intimately with myself, therefore being able to pour intimacy into my partner? How do I communicate my messaging for better understanding to my partner? Uh, What am I afraid of? What's holding me back? How do I say yes to more things versus no to things that my partner might be needing? And I think when we get to a place in our relationship where things get dull or they get comfortable and it's missing some of that spice in the relationship, it's usually because uh, we're bored, but not necessarily with our partner. We might be bored with ourselves. And that that chemistry that you want to feel, that excitement that you want to feel, if you can create that emotion for yourself and bring more passion back for yourself, you will have more then to pour into your partner. So it's kind of that what we've been told many a times of like, love yourself. You have to love yourself before anyone else loves you. Yes. And I think that it's easy to, and I'm saying it very simplified. Yeah. 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 I think, I think it's easy to say, uh, you know, love yourself, love yourself. But like, there's so many ways that we can love ourselves that I think people maybe aren't as familiar with, right. We, when we think of self love, we think of like self care, people instantly want to go to like, okay, well, I got myself a facial. Therefore I love myself. Sometimes self-love looks uh, painful or uncomfortable. Let me say that. And what I mean by that is self-love can also look like there being parts of yourself that you need to grow or you need to stretch or you Mm -hmm. need to work on. (laughs) And that's the part that we like lose out when it comes to the self-love. We're like, oh, I don't really feel like wanting, I don't really feel like wanting to deal with my BS. I just want to, um, you know, make sure that I get my workout in and make sure that like I pampered myself today. Self-love sometimes looks like you strengthening your weaknesses. And if uh, maybe, maybe, and this is like an actual real example, if I tend to be very much um, in my maybe like masculine energy and I'm being selfish because I got business to handle, that may reflect poorly um, in how I make my partner feel that day because I'm operating from like my needs and not necessarily thinking about theirs. And so self-love may be even, hey, maybe I can be selfish. I'm acknowledging that with self-awareness. But then what am I going to do about it? Because that's not necessarily something that's going to help my relationship. If I want love and career, I need to have a balance of both, right? I need to check in with my partner and see mm-hmm. like, how can I show up better for them? So some of the self-love may also look like me working on that negative attribute that could be harming my relationship in the future. Does that make sense? I a hundred percent makes sense because look, whenever I hear the, the, the uh yeah just love yourself mm-hmm. and the rest you know i first i'm like how <laughs> like 
What does that mean yeah. and how? Um, and no one ever has an answer to that. And I am a hundred percent proponent of everybody in this world should go to therapy and work with their for issues. Sure. For sure. So what you're saying really is about that. It's about love yourself and invest, almost invest in yourself mm -hmm. by working through the issues that you have. And that's a huge form of self-love. For sure. Um, I think it's a huge form of self-love is like learning and growing and stretching yourself. It doesn't right. just look like pampering. <laughs> it looks like, okay, if someone, if I worshiped myself, right? If I worshiped myself and I adored myself, would I, can I one, accept who I am right now? Yes, but that doesn't mean that I let the things that I'm not crazy about myself fall to the wayside. If I adored myself, yes. what does adoration for myself look like? How does someone who has adoration for themselves behave? How do they think? How do they feel? How do they treat others if they really adore themselves? And that's the behavior that we need to be doing. That's so good. I hear so many of that, um, the self-love or even body positivity, which I'm all for. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but it goes to a point where I don't understand because I, I, I do think like there are things I don't like about myself still. That doesn't mean I don't love myself. Correct. But it means I can, I, I can't just say, you know, I'm perfect because I'm not. Yep. I want to work on stuff. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah. I think there needs to be I love it. space or room for, for growing certain areas. And we just need to be, you know, kinder to ourselves about it. Well, um, changing gears a little bit. So like I said, I talked to a ton of women. And I do know a ton of incredibly successful women mm -hmm. who are smart and beautiful and kind and just great and are alone. Yeah. Why do you think, do we get in our own way? Like, what's going on? <laughs> Why are people alone? Answer that question. Why are people alone? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. You know, that's a super <laughs> loaded question, right? There's like a million different answers for that. Right. What I'm going to do is try to consolidate um, and give you some of the, um, like a variety of reasons um, based on my practice at The Spicy Life and based on like how I counsel people, um, the patterns that I notice, okay? Um, those extremely ambitious, maybe beautiful and successful um, women haven't had someone set an example for them in a healthy way of what it looks like to balance and multitask career plus love. And mm -hmm. we think that you can only have one or the other and didn't see maybe their parents or maybe their mom set an example of what that looks like, right? Achieving, but also making sure that like uh, their love life is taken care of. And so because we haven't seen a lot of successful relationships, um, we don't have necessarily the, the behavior to mirror. And then nobody really taught us also how to navigate through the dating process to get the successful outcome that we want. Our parents really highlighted and, and, and taught us uh, how to get into school, how to make money, but not so much, okay, baby girl, this is what you need to do, these five things in order to achieve a healthy relationship. And yeah. what's insane to me is like, okay, great. Now we are a group of women who are self-sufficient and we are these, you know, incredible adults, but the getting into the relationship thing is now challenging because also the other element is operating so much in our masculine energy, which is like mm. direction, leadership, doing, um, uh, it's, it's very, it's very much action oriented. And we have shown that we're extremely capable when it comes to achieving the, the goals that we have in life. And then we've focused so much in, you know, in, that gave us so much, you know, gratification for so long that now it's become a part of our identity. But the other element is when we haven't nurtured our feminine energy, which is like the ease, the flow, the, um, the love, the softness, the emotional component. We then think that like, well, how do I, how, how do I show up in relationship or how do I show up in my love life? I've been operating my masculine energy for so long. I don't know how to flip it. And how do you have that balance in learning how to dance gracefully and pivot back and forth in career plus love, it would have been a lot less challenging, but because we were not taught that because, you know, yeah. we, we didn't necessarily know how to do that. 
we get into situations where we do try to have relationship, we get hurt time and time again. And then we decide to put this wall up, making it harder to now get into relationship, but also keeping people out that could potentially love us. Um, and then the other element is like expectations. There's um, a lot of uh, uh, superficial elements that we can talk about. Um, but really, mm. it to me is reflective of competence. People don't know how to be or to have or attract healthy relationships. Do you think it's gotten even worse in the last few years between online dating and just the world of being stuck at home and all of that stuff? I think what I just described, we are taking those people who already didn't have <laughs> the skill set, <laughs> now giving them a tool and device that allows for them to be lazier when it comes to interpersonal development. Yeah. It allows for them to um, overcompensate for the fears of uh, commitment or for um, the fear of being seen. It allows them to um, hide behind. Now, trust me, I'm a huge advocate of technology. I think um, dating apps are some of the, the some of the greatest inventions ever because you're able to connect with people who are not necessarily in your village, right? Or um, mm -hmm. uh, directly in your social group and you're able to meet someone amazing. I've, I've um, walked people down the aisle or I've married because um, I'm officiated as a, um, I've, I've married people and mm -hmm. um, officiated their weddings that have met through dating apps, right? Like I coach them, sh show them how to use the tools and then they knocked it out the park and now they're married. I'm a huge advocate of dating apps. What I'm not, though, is similar to uh, a car, right? Everybody wants a car and everybody wants to be able to drive, but you need a license to drive or you may not get down that road successfully. It's the same thing when it comes to dating apps. If nobody's taught you, if nobody's giving you that license to, to drive within the dating app world, right, um, and how to use the tool effectively, you may crash and burn. And so it's why the coaching element that I provide is so important. You'll see a huge difference in your success rate when it comes to um, even getting the guy to take you out and getting him into um, relationship, you're able to funnel the, the, the window shoppers of the world versus the people who are really dating with intent. When you have- I like your, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I was just gonna say, I like your analogy of the car because in the license, because it's like, you're just gonna crash and burn and you're probably gonna take some other people uh, yep, yep, yep. Out on, the, on your way. <laughs> You're going to, yeah, for sure. You're going to damage a lot of other cars in the process. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you find like, well, I've had so many crash and burns, oftentimes you won't even get on the road. Some, some people will opt out. I'm not going to drive anymore. Right. If we're going to yeah. continue with this analogy. And then other people are like, oh, I'm going to keep driving and just messing everybody up until mm -hmm. I get this. And they're still not learning how to freaking drive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I want to go, I want to circle back to something you said about uh, masculine energy and feminine energy. I, I understand that, I think, and, I, and I'm a believer in energy, so I, I, I do get that. But for some of us, like you said, we've been working in uh, the masculine energy arena, so to speak, so much and so long that this, that switch it's not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned nurturing your feminine energy. Can you talk a little bit about how to do that? Yeah, great example. Um, so for the how part, when it comes to um, understanding energies, you, one, you need to understand the elements of masculinity, right? So I think the education is key. You need to understand what does masculine energy look like and then what does feminine energy look like. And if feminine energy is um, love, flexibility, ease, patience, understanding, kindness, tenderness, right? Those are the elements of feminine energy. And you want more of that because you want to be compatible. You need polarity. You want to be compatible with masculine energy male. The way to nurture those things are to do actions and behaviors that serve those elements. So if I want to be in my feminine I need to do things that make me show up with nurture or tender, tenderness, right? So if um, I'm challenged in moments where I feel like being in my masculine, right? Um, and oftentimes that will happen even in um, relationship with my partner where um, 
you know, it, it happened um, the other morning where <laughs> I wanted him to print out labels um, for the um, for my baby's lunchbox. OK. And he's like, I've showed you how to do this, you know, label make a million times. You know, why don't you know how to print it out yourself? In that moment, I could have been in my masculine energy, defended myself and been combative and um, competitive. Right. Because he may have struck a wound. Instead, for feminine energy, we have to decide, okay, what is the goal? If the goal is to receive help and love from my partner, because I want him to do this active service right now, how can I show up in a way that will one, get the goal achieved? And that means I'm going to have to regulate my emotion. I'm going to have to not be reactive. And in this moment, I'm going to have to be patient and kind, even if that's not what I'm receiving and soften. So it really is about regulation. If you want to practice being in your feminine energy, whether it's at work, whether it's at the park, if it's in your workout, how can I show up in this moment tender and kind, even if that's not what I'm receiving? Does that make sense? It does. It does. It's hard. It sounds a little harder. I, yeah, you have to sit in your softer emotions. And what that, and, but let me tell you, the result of it will be when you're not in your masculine, if you're in your feminine and you want someone to show up with love and softness with you, the only way to get masculine energy male to do that is to be soft with him. There's no way that you're going to get masculine energy male to be soft with you if you're masculine and he's masculine. You're never going to outman a man. So you have to be soft in order to get softness. And you know what? I needed the goal achieved. He printed the label for me for the lunchbox. I came <laughs> home from dropping the baby off. And he's like, you know what? I probably overreacted. I, I, I Sorry for, you know, talking to you like that, babe. I just was frustrated from, you know, a work call earlier that morning where someone, you know, didn't appreciate me. And I took that out on you. Um, can I have a hug right now? And we just hugged it out. I was like, absolutely. He's like, can you forgive me? I said, Absolutely. But I wouldn't have got that response of love if I had shown up in my masculine energy. And so the way that we can sit more in our feminine is not being so reactive to the everyday things, thinking more, okay, what would what would a feminine energy woman do? How would a feminine energy respond in this moment, right? What would a feminine energy do that has a goal to achieve and really just wants love in this moment? I don't know why that is so scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, because of ego. ego and Probably. A lot, yeah. a lot of my masculine energy clients um, prefer to be right and win than they do to have love. And so having to reprogram the, hey, who cares who's right? Who cares about winning when you're going to sacrifice the ultimate award, the ultimate life reward, which is love. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oof. So tell me a little bit, um, a little bit more about the, your program. The Spicy Life program? Yeah, the Spicy Life. Tell us um, I am taking you through 90 days. You're committing yourself to me. Um, and I'm taking you through five phases, right? I mentioned earlier, self, passion, intimacy, mm -hmm. communication, and yes. Um, I'm taking you through weeks of each section and breaking down my method to you and helping you understand formulas and tools that you'll use in relationship and dating. Um, so for the 90 days, I ask that you are abstinent. Um, I, I'm trying to help you connect with your purpose mate. And I can't have you doing that if you're in the bed with somebody else, um, <laughs> because your energy, okay, will be, fair. Your energy will be elsewhere and you'll be distracted and you won't be able to recognize your person when they're in front of you. Um, and if we can't even get them in front of you, because like I said, you're in the bed with someone else. So I just ask for, um, the, the 90 days for you to just be focused on going through the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and that means also not revisiting, uh, situationships and exes, right? We, uh, if you're in a situationship, when you come in, um, we look and see like, does this, is this situation serve us? And is this person going to turn into a real partner? I mean, most of the time it's not. So um, what we're doing is not just assessing like where you're at, but also where you want to go. And so we meet weekly in a coaching session. And then you also have 24 seven access to me to help you navigate through um, emotional experiences or challenges that you may be having. Right. So if um, 
you are uh, on a date and you, you know, are you want to be reactive or you want to uh, potentially like you're, you're maybe you're struggling in a situation, you may go to the bathroom and call me and ask me how to navigate that next step. So you have 24 seven access to me, you know, you're, you're calling me midway so that you don't do some sabotaging behaviors that may have, um, created misunderstanding or, um, to, to, you know, taking you out (laughs) of the dating game in the past. So, uh, in addition to that, you're also, um, I'm redoing your dating profiles. Um, um, helping you with like, not just the verbiage of the profile, but also the photos, I'm helping you navigate through um, how to communicate on the apps and how to uh, get the person from the dating app to cell phone, FaceTime, and then date sooner. So you're looking at how we communicate. And then I'm once I, once, once I know that you understand um, how to speak more colorfully and guide the male's emotions, then I have you, you know, texting yourself 100%. But early on, I'm showing you how to do it. So I'm very hands-on. It's, it's very intense because you're like doing homework based on SBICY and then you're also learning and using these tools out there in the real world. So it's really if you're serious about finding your purpose mate. Correct. I'm uh, Correct. Um, and based on where you come in, you know, you may be a serial dater. You would be amateur dater. You may be a widow that I'm helping heal and learn how to navigate back there out in the world because you were married for 15 years and now you don't know what you're doing. So each person's coming in at a different phase in their life, but it's really about, okay, what's the goal and how do we get there? What's the action plan that we need for you as an individual to be more effective in this area? (sighs) Why are we huffing and puffing? (laughs) Not huffing and puffing, just sighing because it sounds like work. Huh? Like like work. It sounds hard. <laughs> okay. Um, which is good. Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. I don't know where, and I don't know how this idea. I well, I do. I'm gonna. I love Disney, but I'm gonna blame it on Disney. Um, <laughs> this idea of like it's supposed to not require. Work, work came yeah. into I don't I, I don't this narrative of like it's just supposed to be 100 easy we're not supposed to experience and magic break we're not supposed to but <laughs> but when it comes to like every other area of our life whether it's um fitness goals whether it's um you know financial goals we're very much like okay tell me the steps so yeah. that I can do what I need to do in order to get it but when it comes to love and relationship and not just any relationship, you want a healthy relationship, then it's like, oh, but I just want it to fall into my lap. <laughs> I just want it to magically appear. I just, I just want him to see me one day and be like, you're the one, <laughs> the one I've been waiting for. And I'm sorry, but that's not what it looks like. We do, you know, have those people who, um, you know, it, they, they, you know, someone just, you know, they connected with them and, you know, the relationship worked out, but there was still preparation in order to be aligned. And so no one just, it just, it's not, it may feel like magic, but there's always work, even if it's not mindful work. Yeah, you're right. And to be honest, it's not like you want to be with someone who has not been doing their own work. Correct. Because it's right? a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're saving yourself a lot of hurt. <laughs> Correct. And, you and, 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 you know, and in, in pain in relationship, is inevitable. However, the type of pain that you experience, right? Do we want to experience tears of joy or, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, amazing, you know, conflict resolution, or do we want to experience toxicity and heartbreak 24 seven? So you're going to have to do the work so that you can see how you show up in relationship because you are a contributing factor. And oftentimes a common denominator when it comes to these situations, so there has to be work involved, self-evaluation, so that you can make healthier choices in how you show up and then how you show up for someone. Yeah, I like that. No, no, I, don't get me wrong. I think everything you're doing and you're saying is great. And I think that it's a much more realistic and actionable um, way of looking at things than just waiting for that magic that will never come yeah for sure and uh, trust me it is great i believe in the spicy life right my method works i've (laughs) seen the results and for people who are like well that's too much work i don't want to do all that in order to find love 
great. There is a there is a a a world and a partner for you who also doesn't believe in doing the work. And you guys, I hope, find one another because the people who do want to do the work should be together. The people who do want to be overachievers and excel in every area of their life, including love, and want to set an amazing example for their children about how it should look so that they don't come to me when they're you know, 30, 40, 50, trying to figure it out for the first time. Those people need to be together. And the people who don't want to do the work and just figure it out as they go along, they need to be together. Because they are more it. alignment. Okay. So b- this being a lot of work, and th- I've been thinking a lot of this because of certain conversations I've had, actually, interviews for the podcast. But a lot of the times I feel we kind of say, we're going to, I'm going to focus on my career first, and then I'm going to do this other thing. And then I'm going to focus on this other thing. But the reality is the and thens don't usually happen. <laughs> Do you think this is one of like those and then like you need to focus fully on this? Is it something that you kind of can, can, you know, find a way to put it as a balance within your life? Absolutely. I think you need to be doing both, especially if the clock is ticking. And what I mean by that Mm -hmm. is um, we have it in our mind that there are certain career goals that we want to hit maybe by a certain age. And then there's certain love goals that we want to hit by a certain age. Mm-hmm. We put that on ourselves, right? Some of it is a social construct and society puts us on, that on us as well. But some of it is also biological and scientifically proven that like there's this clock. So I don't like to operate in the scarcity fear-based mindset because then you make decisions from fear and poor choices. What I like to operate more is in the positive mindset of I believe that I can have both. And what does someone who has both, what does that look like? How does someone who has both things in their life find time to multitask and juggle both? Because part of where we're living delusionally is thinking if we shut down our feminine energy and we operate more in masculine and we just focus on our career and we achieve these um, financial milestones or these titles that we want or building the business that we want. And then later on, we're going to flip this switch and then focus on love. The challenge with that is you don't get to do that even in relationship, in relationship, I don't get to just shut down for a year and then decide that I'm going to show up for my partner or then I'm going to show up for my kid. I have to learn to multitask even now running the spicy life and being responsible for my new son and for my husband. And mm-hmm. so this notion of like, I get to shut down and then turn it on it, it doesn't serve you. You have to learn how to multitask now so that when you do get everything that you want and more, you know how to run it full and functioning. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Yes, absolutely. Because life will life doesn't wait. Correct. And so we then put ourselves in a situation where we look up and we're like, okay, well, I want a kid and I want a husband. I focus on my career. Now let me turn that on. And now... We're you talking to me, man. Are you talking to me, man? <laughs> and now we're like, uh, and we also maybe don't have the tools because we haven't invested in our love life and learning these tools. That now we're making decisions from a, a fear based mindset or from a from a clock, and we're choosing or accepting anything that we can get because you've starved yourself from a healthy love for so long. When you're starving, you'll eat anything you're handed. So mm-hmm. you're, you'll take the scraps if you're starving. And if you're yep. afraid that you're going to continue starving, you'll, you'll eat whatever's handed to you. And I don't want that for folks, but for the folks that have been starving themselves, they still need to, they really need to do the work then. Like, okay, let's believe that no matter what age we are, 40, 41, 42, 43, we, 44, 45, 50, 60, whatever, we still are worthy of love and deserving of it, but we still don't get to escape stepping outside of our comfort zone and doing the work. Love does exist for you. There's someone else who is maybe uh, focused on career too that now needs to show up and who wants love. But how do we get in alignment with them? How do we get in front of them? Well, I know the answer. (laughs) (laughs) But I'm saying ask yourself that. If you don't know. Right. And that's the thing. This This is the challenge. This is the problem that I have, okay? People are like, well, I want this and I want this and I want this and I want this. They have their list. Um, When I do the work with you, I have an exercise that I give that helps us really um, refine our list and be very clear on what we want. 
But then the other element is when you don't have the assistance, right? Um, right. You don't know how to get what you want. And most people can come up with the list of like, well, I want these, you know, 20 things. Okay, well, let me see you get it. Most people don't know how to get or yeah, even attract what it is that they are attracted to. If you are someone who doesn't know how to attract what you are attracted to, if you never had the list of what you wanted, you really need to do the work. Because even if I were to hand you the person that is on that list, right? You wrote your list of things and I'm handing you the person directly. Because you haven't done the work, you still may mess it up and not even recognize that that's your person. Because of Just old, let it go. old yeah. behaviors, old things that that have you know blinded you or you haven't been in a healthy, committed relationship in so long. You don't even appreciate or know what it looks like when, you know, someone shows up with that. So it's really helping you change your frequency. That that point you just said about not being able to appreciate it if because you've been, you know, you've not been in a committed relationship for so long or whatever it is. And then sometimes things are right in front of you and you don't know them. That's that's so true. Yeah, we've, we've also turned, we've become a society also that has an abundance of options, right? I like to say Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. There's, we all have a favorite flavor though, even two favorite flavors, but we will still go out there and want to taste all 31 flavors, afraid that we're going to choose the wrong one. But at the end of the day, there's a flavor that best serves you that you're always going to come back to that's healthiest for you. But yet you're wasting all this time wanting to sample and bringing yourself to that, not really doing the work to see, okay, what am I most compatible with? And what the things that I that I want, is that a want or is this a need? And if it's a need, what am I seeking? What is it going to provide for me? And also, how do I show up in order to get that? I love this, actually. <laughs> I know, I know you're like, oh my gosh, uh, the, the, the wheels are spinning and you're like, oh, I don't feel like doing the work. But if you don't feel like doing the work to get the person along this journey, you're not going to do the work after the commitment because you haven't practiced working. Uh, no, I, yeah. The way you, you, you lay it down, which I, I actually really enjoy this tough love. Uh, the way you're laying it down, it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. It's true. If you're not used to doing the work, then when are you, 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 it's work. It's work all the time. And sometimes we need to even, um, if we need to reframe it, if we're like, well, I don't want to have multiple jobs, right? Because sometimes work can sound daunting. Okay, let's gamify it, right? Let's make it more playful. Let's make it softer. Let's make it more enjoyable. Now let's make our, our, our love life and our dating life into a game. And we make it more Ooh. of a passion project and a hobby. We make fun with it versus making it sound like it's this like other job we have to clock into. Let's make it more about learning and becoming better at this passion project, right? That sounds a lot sexier. It feels a lot better. We don't necessarily have to call it work. That's a very good, it, it, the, it, <laughs> need to repackage it. And I'm going to be like, yes, I'm all for it. Yeah. we need. Um, to, and I'm perfectly fine with repackaging it. Whatever type of person you are, if you, if you're, if you're more a strategic person, um, let's do it. If you need to repackage it and make it more um, fun and soft and playful, let's do it. Either way, I need you to do it. <laughs> you don't get to escape <laughs> the doing. Can I just ask you one thing? How do you deal with all these people? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it sounds like a such a like relationship intensive job. Oh, absolutely. But it is my purpose. So because it's always purpose driven, right? Somebody can, I can give you the best advice in the world and then you not take it. And then you call me and you're like, I didn't take your advice, but now I need your help because I messed it up. Okay. One, I have to step outside of ego because I really want to be like, what? I told you exactly how to do for this, right? Um, and <laughs> but really it starts with like the same thing that I used the example earlier when I give you the example of like my husband and I, it's really about managing my own energy before I manage somebody else's. The power mm. of managing someone else's energy is crazy. You, When you um, have the ability to make a person feel a certain sentiment and that sentiment directs their footsteps to a certain outcome, that's a powerful piece. It's even powerful yeah. in romantic relationship, right? I can I have the ability 
to destroy my husband's day or make it the best day of his life. That's a powerful ability. But based on only my ability to manage myself and my emotions, can I do that? And so the emotional management for myself, the emotional regulation that I have for myself is how I manage all of my clients. First, making sure like, okay, Mm. how do I show up for me? Then how do I show up for them? Right. What's my goal with my client? Is my goal with my client for them to have understanding or and to get, you know, um, their relationship goals achieved? Or is my goal to be right right now and to be heard and to tell you I told you so and to, you know, go off on you? If if going off on you is not going to achieve the goal or making fun of you or uh, you know, punishing you, you know, if that's mm-hmm. not gonna achieve the goal of you getting understanding and the execution of what I want, then in this moment I need to take a beat and give you maybe positive reinforcement or maybe you just even the answer to solve for so that we can get closer to the step of the goal. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's so, like you said, it's very related to like the example you said with your husband. And I think it's something we can all learn because we're all, whatever we do for our career or life, it's all about relationships. Everything is about relationship. Everything, even even right. what I just had for breakfast. What's my relationship with food? Right? Like, mm-hmm. am I going to give myself the healthy breakfast, or am I going to give myself a candy bar? Like, everything has a relationship. Um, this water, that I'm, everything that has a relationship, and everything has energy. How do I want to fuel myself? How do I want to be connected to it? Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. <laughs> You wanted to say work, but you're like, okay, I'm going to game it by No, it's been a lot of fun. The work is like, because I'm already imagining what I need to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the work. Um, but I'll let, I'll let our, our, pod, our podcast people know what happens. Imagining, imagination is great. That is um, you saying, okay, I, I can see my future. Now we just got to do the steps to get there. Yeah. Well, let's go to, because I've, I've definitely kept you a lot longer than <laughs> I could have. Um, so let's do our little lightning round. If you still have some time. Okay. What's the lightning round? Okay. It's just silly. Some questions and you can respond with one sentence or less. Mm-hmm. Um, does pineapple belong on pizza? No. <laughs> I'm just answering or am I telling you why? I'm just answering, right? You can tell me why. Oh, um, no, I don't like uh like sweet with savory. Um really? Yeah, I don't uh I do not like sweet like on any of my foods. I don't like um uh teriyaki sauce. I don't think that <laughs> I can only eat sweet when it's dessert or breakfast. Like I'll eat like fruit on maybe something, but I do not like mixing fruit on my, on my pizza. And I love pizza. <laughs> a lot of people don't. I'm a pro pineapple person. Heck no. Oh my God. No. Pineapple <laughs> salad, okay. <laughs> Would you rather explore outer space or the bottom of the ocean? Outer space. Oh my God. I would love to explore outer space. Yeah, me too. Favorite mythical creature. Uh, the unicorn and Pegasus. Oh, yeah. Good ones. Uh, if your house caught on fire, what's the first object you would run to save? My husband and son. Are they objects or no? <laughs> no, they're not objects. <laughs> but good that that's the first thing. Um, uh, probably like our... Uh, oh, I would definitely grab my wedding ring. <laughs> um, there you go. Our, the, the wedding ring and just like our passports and birth certificates so that we can oh. renew <laughs> I never had anyone answer passports and that is passports and birth certificate. And that is so smart. Yeah. I just, I, we need to get everything replaced and we can't do that if we don't have an identity. So smart. <laughs> <laughs> um, most used app on your phone. Most used app. Does the photos count as one? Cause I feel like, or does the camera? No, that doesn't count as an app. Huh? Yeah. Um, oh, probably because I read it every single day um, as a part of my self-love is uh, my Jesus calling. Um, My Jesus Mm -hmm. calling is uh, um, my scriptures that I read um, to start my day to kind of fuel my love cup first. I fill it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that way um, it sets my tone for the day. Nice. 
Um, best piece of advice you've ever been given? Best piece of advice I've ever been given? Um, probably from my mom. <laughs> um, my mom uh, gave me um, the advice of, which was really like an opening eye, eye, opening moment for me. Uh, I was going through a, a time when I was in a toxic relationship and and was making a list of like his pros and cons because I was trying to decide whether to stay with him or not. And my mother went back to uh, self, which is like the beginning of spicy. Um, and she was like, you don't need to make the list for him. You need to make the list for yourself because mm. why are you trying to be in a relationship with someone and rationalize being in a tumultuous relationship this is not about him this is about you what inner work do you need to do and um this was like very early on right and I'm like oh my god this is it was a game changer for me because right then and there you know I I understood that it, it's the inner work I had what about me makes me want someone like him and um I till this day I tell that to my clients that's so good that's so good and what a smart woman your mother I know she is my reason for the season. <laughs> Finally, what's one thought you'd want to leave with our listeners? Let's not make decisions out of fear. Let's make decisions out of love. If we Ooh. make decisions out of fear, we, we're going to choose uh, oftentimes um, wrong. If we make decisions from a place of love, does this get me closer to love or does it pull me further away from healthy love? Um, we'll make a lot more accurate decisions. I feel like I needed to hear that. Yay. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. This has been fun. Absolutely. Happy that uh, I could be of service. And we're back. Hello. Hi. She, um, I, th it made me think about uh, just re-listening to this that I need to reach out to her. Yeah, she's so good. It's it's. I literally had my friend is a journalist, and she's doing a piece on relationship coaches. And she was offhanded when she's like, "Yeah, I'm having to find relationship coaches." And I was like, "Go look up Spicy Mari. Like, to go talk to her. Like, for your piece." And I also sent her a couple more people in the Elevate community because I was just like, "Remember, I work with a women's network. Like, I, I know a lot of." Guys. And she's like, "Oh yeah, uh, yeah, definitely." <laughs> and so I sent her a bunch of people. Uh, sharing the love. So let's help people with that too by telling them what's going on with Elevate this week. Yes. If you want to meet with the Elevate community yourself, you can come to our Elevate Roundtable where we're going to be talking about navigating transitions to successfully create organizational change. That is on Thursday. Next Tuesday is our uh, upcoming community circle. Uh, it's going to be the Hispanic, Latina, and Latinx community circle. Uh, I know Maricela goes to a lot of them. I don't yep. know if you're going to this one. Uh, it's on my calendar. It's on your calendar. So she will be there. I will try to be uh, there. If if, she will... if if things remain as they are, I will be there. The Elevate podcast can make no promises as to Marcelo's attendance at the event. <laughs> but I hope I can be because to be honest, these are fantastic spaces. And even if I'm not there, you're going to meet some great people. And Sofia Pertuz, who is the host, is just, she's just amazing. So I would, I, I highly recommend that you take some time. We only do it once a month, the Hispanic Latinx community circle. So if you can go, please go. And then if you're looking for in-person networking uh, and you are in Dubai, you can come to the Elevate Iftar, which is uh, today, Wednesday. Or if you're in Pittsburgh, um, they're having an in-person coffee chat all about career resilience this Friday. Yeah, lots of stuff coming up with our chapters. Um, it's a little quiet because, you know, there's a little bit of a spring break lull. But yeah, and there might be there might have been again, we do usually do these a week or two in advance. Um, there might have been more added. Definitely check the website to see what's coming up. Yeah. And make sure to keep an eye out. Our chapters are busy making things happen. And so are we with our online programming. So join us. Yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm looking forward to the DFW chapter just posted several in-person events that I think starting mid-April, I might be able to start going there. So if you're in DFW, um, I might see you there. Very cool. We're all getting, we're all spread out. 
Indeed. And let's talk about some women making history. Let's do it. So this week, our history makers are Jennifer McClellan, who became the first black woman elected to Congress from Virginia. Wow. Yeah. Sonia Guajarjara became the first head of Brazil's Ministry of Indigenous Peoples. Karen Julian became the first woman CIO of the University of St. Thomas. See, I I said this last time. We're seeing more university first, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I knew this was coming too because I was like, in my head, when I when you were saying that last week, I was like, I'm pretty sure next week's has an education one too. Very cool. Nikki Haley became the first woman of color to be a major candidate for the Republican nomination for president. Raquel Martinez became the first Latina to be elected president of the National Association of Secondary School Principals Board of Directors. Education again. Education. And also I got the Latina again. Yeah. <laughs> Emma J. Weber became the first lesbian Miss Great Britain finalist. Really? And her, yeah, her outfit is so cool. We're going to post it on, we're posting this on our, our um, social media. So cool. It's like all rainbow. Well, congrats to the history makers. Congratulations. Who do we have coming up next week? Oh, next week. Um, you are going to hear my conversation with Karen Dillon. So... Karen is so smart, <laughs> like so smart. She is the former editor of Harvard Business Review magazine and co-author of The Micro Stress Effect, How Little Things Pile Up to Create Big Problems and What to Do About It. She's also the co-author of other books, um, including How Will You Measure Your Life, which we talk about quite a bit um, during this episode. Competing Against Luck, The Story of Innovation and Customer Choice, and The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Can Lift Nations Out of Poverty. She, again, she's really, really, really smart. She knows they've done so much research, her and her co-authors. And, I mean, obviously, I was really excited because editor, former editor of the Harvard Business Review, again, I'm a nerd, HVR, I love it. And, but we talk about micro stress and it's, it's a great, it's not great actually, kind of not great at all, but it's good that they've put a name to this thing where that we feel and oftentimes didn't know how to call it. So I learned a lot about, um, I learned a lot by talking to her. And in fact, I think I mentioned micro stress and similar things in other podcast interviews I've done since I had this conversation with Karen. So I hope you enjoy it and also get to learn as much as I did. And also uh, shout out to her for being super sweet and understanding because I don't know if you can tell in the podcast, but we had tech issues uh, the first time we tried to record her podcast and it, we lost like almost the entire interview and we had to like kind of tail between her legs go to her and be like I am so sorry this has never happened before yeah. and she was just like that's all right I understand let's re-record it and so game for it yeah she was great about it um and I do mention sometimes like oh when I talked to you the first time or when yeah. I talked to you last time I remember saying that in a couple of times of the on the episode and we were kind of honestly we were a little like oh we had such a great conversation the first time we were a little worried like can will this kind of come out as good because you know will we have the same rapport and the same energy and we did and of course I like to go to these a lot a little bit with my curiosity at you know top level so I can ask all these questions and of course I had satisfied a lot of my curiosity <laughs> earlier but it I don't know I think I think you're gonna you're gonna enjoy it yeah, it'll be really good. I send you a lot of podcast guests nowadays that I think will pique your curiosity because I find that you really enjoy those podcasts. Yeah, I like I, there's a lot of things I'm I like learning about. And uh, this is one of them. So, yeah, well, we will see you then when you uh, next week when you interview Karen Dillon. Yeah. See you next time. See you then. Bye. Elevate Network drives real results for ambitious women trying to break through the glass ceiling and achieve success in their careers. We offer a platform full of resources and opportunities for growth, all designed to help you unlock your potential. With Elevate's support, you can take the first step toward achieving your professional goals. 
With a supportive community and tangible resources at your fingertips, you're only one step away from reaching your fullest potential. Join us today and take advantage of our 30-day free trial to start building the career of your dreams. Thanks so much for listening to the Elevate podcast. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe, give us five stars, and share your review. You can learn all about Elevate membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com. That's E-L-L-E-V-A-T-E network.com. And special thanks to our producer, Catherine Heller. She rocks. Thanks so much and join us next week.